All right, so I'm here with horror guru Brian Norton, who was actually one of the earliest teachers I had in figuring out why movies work, how they work. Uh, and now I have the opportunity to talk to him about some of the things he's done and some of the movies he likes to watch and maybe get into an argument about, about some of them so. with him. Yeah, uh, especially the horror genre, which does sort of divide a lot of people uh, yeah. for, for a lot of reasons. Well, what, uh, what, what first... Um, you know, uh, we're just reminiscing here. You were my student 10 years ago. Over. I Over can't believe it's been ago, 10 yeah. years. Yeah. So we had some good times, though. We had a fun class, right? It was, yeah. And, and what I definitely like to see is that, you know, a lot of people go into this and that so much time has passed. Yeah. And we're both still miserably beating away at it. Well, you know, it's <laughs> beating off at it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, no, you remember my old uh, crazy horror apartment. Yes, <laughs> yes. You, Brian had the greatest collection of posters and memorabilia. I mean, you walk into this place oh, as a film geek. It, I it's just, miss that apartment. You're like, when I grow up, that's where I want to live. God, that's how I thought everyone in New York lived that way. It was like a 2,500-square-foot yeah, apartment. it was and great. I almost thought it was like a, a production office. Well, I, I declared uh, – some of it on my taxes for that because I had my home office in there. Well, but yeah, I shared if, it if with were, everybody. Yeah, if, if you worked out of there, yeah. then I had then a full bar. Right. Do you remember? I had a yes, full bar I with do. a jukebox. I and do. you know, when I moved, I couldn't even get anyone to take the jukebox. I had to push it out onto the curb. Really? Yeah, but 1984 Rockola with all those beautiful. Even all the like, retro lovers, all, like no, American Pickers, no, didn't want it. No one. Yeah, it had to go now. So yeah, but anyway. Yeah, but it was it was great, and I remember you had a great DVD collection and. Yeah. I was trying to find the most obscure movie that I recognize there to sort of brag a little bit. <laughs> uh, and now you're actually, you're working, we'll get to a little later, but you're working on a book for the Amityville Horror Series. Yes, this is wonderful uh, publisher called Bear Manor Media. And they, I, I'm the one who buys their books, but they, they publish beautiful hardcover books on film and TV. Very niche, like I can't imagine so many people would want them. But uh, yeah. but uh, yeah, and uh so I get to write on the first three movies, and um, I signed a book contract, and it's going to be out next year, and it's just so much fun. But, uh, you know, because I talk about this stuff in mm -hmm. my sleep, but it hits me now that these movies are like 40 years old. Yeah. And trying to track down everybody is, because uh, everyone's dying. I got Margot Kidder interviewed the two days before she died. Wow. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, because you start thinking about it, it's like, I mean, my personal definition of, like, what's a new movie, it's like, oh, what's anything that was after 2000? Sure. That's, like, 18 years ago yeah. now. You yeah. Know, and it's totally, the technology is totally different. Everything's totally different now. And we just, uh, you just mentioned American Graffiti a few yeah. minutes ago, and I'm interviewing uh, Candy Clark, yeah. who got the Oscar nomination for American Graffiti, because she was in Amityville 3D, so I can't wait to talk to her. And I'm sure after this much time has passed with, with movies like that, to be able to discuss it with them, you're probably getting stories, and they've had time to reflect on it themselves also. So sure. Every now and then, I'll get someone who said, like, I was in Amityville 3D? <laughs> oh, okay. Meg Ryan is 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 becoming a difficult one. Cause if it, it happened between time. 1979 and 1985, <laughs> I don't remember it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was my fun period. Uh, I mean, I have to ask, because you obviously love all kinds of movies. Right. I learned a lot about film theory from you. Why sort of the horror genre, which is considered sort of, I don't want to insult the genre, but it's considered no, the no. simplest genre in I, terms of structure I and all totally, that. Totally, I totally understand. And, uh, and you know, it used to be like the dirty secret, mm -hmm. you know, and I have a, for lack of a better term, a very high film school uh, pedigree, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I got like several degrees. I'm practically a doctor, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know. Um, not that, that that helps, but, you know, I went to... I got my cinema studies degree from Sarah Lawrence, and then you know my degrees from NYU. So, and uh, that was like the that was the trashy thing then. You know, you kept that secret. You didn't want to make a horror movie for your thesis. That was so looked down upon. So, but I uh, I've been asked that before, and um, I think it was maybe because they were just so forbidden. I don't know. I mean, I was a first generation VHS kid, and that's when that whole sort of post Halloween boom came and. Yeah. Well, the 70s resurgence in general, I mean, a lot of it also, I think, got the stigma because it came from, like, porn. Porn funded yeah. a lot of the, the 70s horror movies. Right, right, right. The early, the early Yeah, the earlier yeah. one. Yeah, Wes Craven started off but doing But the that. more that, you know, you look at something like the first Friday the 13th, which is so innocuous and campy now, but listen to Siskel and Ebert's original review where they're, this is movies destroying America, and all it did was make you want to see it, you yeah. know? So, and, and then I... Yeah. Everything's always destroying America, and now they're making... You know, yeah. Hollywood movies about the making of it. Yeah. And 
I mean, that has got an X rating for the violence, and now you can see that stuff on, on TV. But uh, I don't know, something about the circus and the ceremony of it, and, you know, and I admit, some of these movies I, I romanticize that mm -hmm. are wonderful, and maybe some of them just have good poster art. Yeah. I mean, we're looking at some great poster art for some pretty mediocre yeah. movies. But, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I guess my personal issue with, and I love horror when it's done a certain way, my issue is, like, the whole Final Girls concept, where there's the Final Girl in the movie, where... You know, when I watch a movie, I want to be drawn forward. And that's, you know, as a filmmaker, you're always taught you have to draw the audience forward. You have to use mise en scène, all this stuff, all these tools and tricks to sort of drag them forward with the narrative. Well, if you know this one character is just going to be running around for two hours and you're right. just waiting for two hours for her to die, at some point it does feel like horror porn where it's just what's going to happen to her in two hours. Right. So you're just watching for that. Well, for your, for your listeners who might not know that that pop culture term can you w explain what the final girl concept is well in, in horror movies there's always the the final girl the one who survives everything to the end and yes it's it's gotten to a point where horror movies are now even made sort of like parodying that yeah. or you know there were very two meta movies. yeah you, one yeah. of your, actually your friend directed uh, f the final girls the final girls yeah the year well, before that Kyle Schulson. there was a movie with uh, abigail breslin called final girl so. yeah it's uh, and and that's the thing where it's when you're making a movie like that what is the story that you're following? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm asking, what, what's the story that you're following? Well, do you know, believe it or not, De, De Palma got called on the carpet with this because uh, he was criticized, especially with Dress to Kill, and, mm -hmm. and the, the ironic part was that it was his wife acting <laughs> in the movie, and technically she's like the final girl. Yeah. And, and he was always accused of being misogynistic, and he, he said, you know what? I like women. I like to photograph women. Call me sexist, but there is something more compelling about a woman in peril than a man in peril. I'm sorry, you could kill me. And you know, sometimes they have deviated from that formula, mm -hmm. and it didn't always work. I yeah. mean, there's a, there's a few slasher movies that uh, that actually before the rules were even written didn't necessarily have a final girl, but it's 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 going to be a staple. I don't I don't yeah. I don't know. I but it's the hero's journey of a horror movie. Yeah, I mean, and I have, I have these opinions. I certainly don't mean for them to be controversial, but they kind of piss people off a little bit. But when I talk about the the final girl syndrome or the Sigourney Weaver syndrome, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know how in Aliens that gets a free pass and everyone's like, it's the same thing. It's a yeah, it's the same type of movie, just yeah. in space. Yeah, but uh, I don't know this whole thing about like, oh, it's a woman kicking ass. It's feminist. Just I, I, I don't, I don't. It's if it, you think about it, an alien, she masculinizes herself. She yeah. puts on men's clothes. She calls the monster a bitch, which is a slur. So it's like, you know, I, I, I don't know. I at least like I'll even argue in the Friday the Thirteenth movies, they get to be like a, a real regular teenager, yeah. and she doesn't all of a sudden know karate and kung fu. Yeah, they're just young, dumb, and full of cum, and yeah. people die. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's that's a little bit more, I think, just realistic than I just. Like, I remember when they remade Night of the Living Dead and the character of Barbara, who's like a little mouse in the original, she's like, Ch -ch -ch with the gun, like, come on. Yeah. And I'm like, that's not feminism. That's just male fantasy, right? Well, it's there. also not something the audience can relate to, I mean, in my opinion. But, the, know, but sometimes they do. They, they do turn them into a, a superhero. I, I remember uh, a Gene Siskel's, if you can see it on YouTube, his original review of... Halloween, and he said the difference why Halloween was so good, and you know some of these other movies weren't so good. He says like, you empathize and identify with the Jamie Lee Curtis character. He said when she's in the closet hiding and he's breaking the door, you're in the closet with her. So um, I don't know, but it, it's uh, if I was against horror movies, I could totally write an amazing <laughs> um, what is the word? dissension yeah. on it. So. I but, mean, well, John Carpenter with, with Halloween, that's just, I personally find it a masterpiece, but both as a horror and as a comedy. And that's something else I want to talk to you about, because the whole concept of horror movie, it's supposed to scare you. But it's gotten to a point where people look for these movies to laugh. Sure. I mean, and just personally, does that bother you, or do you enjoy that aspect of it to sort of, you know, have a good time while watching a horror movie? Or are, are you a purist? Do you still believe you should watch a horror movie? A, a good horror movie is one that terrifies you. Well, uh, I'll be, I mean, let's be realistic. How many actually terrify you? You know, I can, 99% don't even have one scare that actually works. It, yeah. um, that's not necessarily a deal breaker for me. As far as laughing at them, you know, we, we 
there is a certain amount of looking back and laughing at something that is so cheesy. One of the things I hate is when, you know, I, I firmly believe that you, uh, to make a cult movie, it sort of has to happen, happen by accident. Mm -hmm. The movie's made with integrity or whatever, and then years later it's discovered. And mm -hmm. now we get a whole bunch, and I'm guilty because I've, had, I've been hired to write some of them that are bad on purpose, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just, it's cheating. You know, you purposely make it campy or whatever. And yeah. uh, it's amazing how many, like the Sharknado syndrome, it's, a, it's amazing how popular some of that stuff is. Yeah, you at, know? at that point, is it even horror? It, it's just comedy. Yeah. But um, I want people, you know, oh, that's so cheesy. I want to. I I like the ones that maybe were a train wreck on accident or whatever. But uh, you know, I, I don't mind sense of humor. I think mm -hmm. I think sense of humor is uh, important. But um, you know, it's like now now since the I don't know they make fun of all the obvious. Oh, the the black guy brother dies first, or mm -hmm. you know, and uh, these you know, they're repeating the same things. That's, that's, to me, that's just not funny anymore. I'd rather yeah. I'd rather have that serious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when the cliche has been already parodied at that point, you just need to sort of, you know, put it away in a box. Yeah, and, I don't know. mind if they go back to those cliches, yeah. but uh, making fun of them, it's like the easiest thing in the world to make fun yeah. of, you know, yeah. so. And that's, you know, you and I talked about Tarantino, and I'm not here to throw him under the bus. It's yeah. like, because that would be insulting, but that's where the, the true cinema fans... It's like, you know, he's doing these huge budget Roger Corman movies and, and we know the source. Yeah. And we're and this is where you and I start to sound like an old man. Yeah. Get off my lawn. It's you not know. how it used to be. Yeah, exactly. So my, my my students loved Tarantino without knowing that all this wonderful stuff came from, you know, mm -hmm. horror movies. But they I called Tarantino the the cover band and that would yeah. get them really upset. Yeah. Well Tarantino is someone like not to knock him, there's some of his movies that I love a lot. Sure. I mean obviously I have a lot of criticism for a lot of the stuff that he does. But he's someone I feel I'd much rather watch a movie with than necessarily wait for one of his yeah. upcoming movies. Sure. Because, I mean, you can't argue the guy clearly has good taste. Yeah, I mean, and I, I do have to appreciate the fact that, especially me, always uh, admiring a disreputable genre, it would take him saying something in an interview that would legitimize it and often get it released on video. I mean, yeah. I've had disastrous screenings where no one came. Like, why would you show Amityville 2? I had a 16 millimeter print of it. And then the next year, he said it was the greatest sequel since Godfather 2, and now everyone gets it. So yeah. this is where I get mad about people's reaction to him. Well, but he, he, can, he can set, I mean, he got Blowout released. Which on, is, on Laserdisc. Well, I have a funny, that's a whole different conversation about Brian De Palma yeah. and sort of like, but, why does he even need to have this happen? But, the, the, uh, you know, people, he can legitimize it. So, and, and, yeah, and the older I get, the less it's about directors. I'm like sort of anti autorist yeah. now. But, um, yeah, he's a big he's a big genre fan, and, and he's helped happened. a lot of these movies get released. Even when uh, we originally met, that was the exact period where My Bloody Valentine, when he started talking about it, and it felt like overnight everybody you know had my bloody valentine as the greatest horror movie on their list that's that's right you know and overnight. because of that they got paramount to release the recently unearthed uh x-rated print and the remake going which i viciously went after i've i've never tried to get a gig as hard as that one yeah. and uh, i realized that lionsgate they they didn't want a fan they wanted the title. Yeah. They, 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 they didn't want to watch the original. They, 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 they got a... But that's you know. sort of the problem with, like, how do you remake these sort of low-budget cult movies with yeah. a studio budget, with studio yeah. intent? It, I, it doesn't work. Like you said, it has to sort of happen by accident. I, I, I understand. And, you know, like, I, I, I wanted it because I wanted to do fan service mm -hmm. to it, but they, you know, they, that, that would have been wrong. So they needed to recoup their money. So, because the first one didn't even do any business, yeah. you know. But anyway, yeah, they made it in 3D. Yeah, well, that was when it was just start being yeah. the new 3D. Patrick which, Lussier directed yeah, Every it. generation thinks they're the first to do anything. So it's like, <laughs> oh, we're, we're bringing 3D to the world. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the reason why I bring it up because there's the, the famous horror movie sort of like The Shining which there's a lot of debate about it. I personally love the movie even though I don't necessarily see is, it as a horror movie is there debate about it I want to find that debate I need someone on my team a lot of people that I I've heard say it's not scary they don't like it and, I, and that's I, the thing I, I, I see well, there's a lot of horror movies that aren't I want to find them I want to find them I can introduce you to them they're uh, I can back it septuagenarians up, but Listen. they're very nice what is it that I even mean they're I young I think 70s oh, oh, 70s oh you know it's 
I lose friends over this, but I back it up. I, I back it up with well, with, we, we with, used to debate about it with all the time, with, yeah. with facts and everything, but uh, or just you know, and I, I'm loyal to it. I know. I mean, I grew up with that movie, but I, I do think people are just blinded by it. I think if we took his name off of it, I know it's like like telling a Christian you hate Jesus or whatever, yeah. but. Uh, I'm I, sorry, I can't uh, forget that Stanley Kubrick directed it for a second. Jack Nicholson poses no threat to me. He's a drunk guy with a limp. Walk past him. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's whatever scares me about that movie is obviously not Jack Nicholson or yeah. killing his family. It, it's just the concept. I mean, anything supernatural is always about right. But it, like but that. there but there is a, a threat. I mean, in the house, the, the, the movie the family, is, yeah. is is them in peril. But yeah. if he is, his, the only thing dangerous is his whiskey breath. Yeah, and I I've noticed something that even even when it came out, you know he's the threat. It's a I have never seen a movie. Everyone I know wants to have a beer with that character. They hate Shelley Duvall. Yeah, when when he's like I'm gonna bash your brain. They're applauding it. it, yeah, like, it the kid's a little annoying also. It, he's a little annoying. With no, the but it brings out like the, the the misogyny in in the, the like the audience hates her and they love him. Yeah, I see people cheering when, yeah, when he's they bashing they, in the they, door. They always yeah. have. And I think that here's Johnny Plus, saying, whatever, well, that's as bad as any of Freddy's wisecracks. Well, Jack Nicholson is also Jack Nicholson. You know, yeah. I just find it difficult for him to ever play a character right. you wouldn't want to sure. have a beer with. Right, right. But I know, but the, the, the movie is predicated on the fact that he's, he's, he's a, a, a dangerous person. That's where I person. disagree. I think what's scary about that movie is not that situation that's happening in that hotel, but that it can happen anywhere at any time. And that's sort of what terrified me. And there was a documentary on it. Well, oh, it yeah. I, I knew that I couldn't which watch that. Which had some of the most... I mean, I, 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 I thought it was hilarious because some of the theories in there were... Well, I'm like, welcome, after welcome a certain age, my... just stop doing psychedelics because well, it, it's... The, uh, where because people the uh, minotaur thing there and can all be that. no deductive reasoning i i will have a conversation about the shining if so, we can talk about it as a movie and you don't mention kubrick and again yeah. as a teacher for 14 years most people don't even know what a director does yeah i, I totally agree i think and that just i think is with i would say 60 to 70 yeah. percent of movies where if you take the the label off of it the filmmaker's name off of it i would I'm not, i wouldn't say the shining wouldn't be successful right I just feel it would it would be more like sort of a Henry portrait of a serial killer. But but then there's always the assumption now that if uh, someone doesn't like that movie, then oh that movie's just too smart for them, or they I didn't get it. No, unfortunately I I did get yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but again, I am very very loyal to it. I, you know, I I I this is where I, I resort to Tarantino or De Palma because I think that their opinion holds much more credence yeah. than mine. But. Um, Apparently, De Palma and Kubrick were very good friends, and, and in, a, in an interview in 1980, they asked Brian De Palma, like, so, Stanley working in your genre, what do you think? And he's like, oh, I saw The Shining. Stanley, <laughs> this is what you get when you have a director working in a genre that he has complete and utter contempt for. And I honestly, yes, I sort of feel that way. And, and it does come off. When I see an interview with a, a director who's done a new horror movie and they talk about what his influence is, if he says The Shining and Rosemary's Baby, I know I'm in trouble because that is those are the two safe go-to answers. Yeah. And uh, I, I, it's probably they're, they're making that movie <laughs> not because they want to. Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of becomes highbrow horror and, and then the slasher genre yeah. Where, yeah. where you're going to have cheerleaders getting butchered. And the one sure. thing I loved was... Uh, but I isn't mean, it funny? I mean, I will defend those movies, but I think that, I do think that The Shining is, is, is pretentious, but let's go through all it. movies because well, <laughs> people don't realize how much work goes into even bad movies. The only movie I won't sort of defend is a movie where the intent wasn't love, where they didn't love making the movie, the right. process of it. But any movie, I mean, I'll defend just because whoever was making it wanted to tell what? some sort of story. But that, yeah, but also at the same time, I have to, I have to keep my prejudice in check because I also know about the production history of The Shining, and you could have done 50 movies. Oh, For yeah. the stuff that he had available to him, you know, I, I just, I think, I think it's just absurd. Well, I'm sure they did make 50 movies. We just only saw the one that was released. I, uh, I but again, how, 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 how insulting is that to the guy? I, 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 I just, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's almost critic proof. But I will say this: Do we agree that the movie is about the, the season that he stays there? Right? Like he's there for how many yeah. months? Uh, it's well, just the winter, sort of. But it's the winter. It's like for, 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 for a few months. Yeah. Okay. Then there's no narrative purpose that we have Monday. 
Tuesday, Wednesday. I, it sounds cool. It looks cool. Tell me what that means. If that guy wasn't famous, you would laugh at him for putting there. Why that time clock there? It serves no purpose. I mean, I, I like it for certain reasons because with each each time they're telling you something, it sort of it goes from telling you the month to the day to the time, where it's sort of like a countdown to when shit's gonna hit the fan. But I, I definitely agree with you. Where if Kubrick's fame name wasn't on it, it would be a cult yeah. classic, and a movie cost what was it, fifty million dollars in yeah. nineteen eighty. But even like cheesy Amityville Horror, which I'm writing about, it's you know the true story of the family that spent twenty eight days in the house and then left. They have the countdown, fourteenth day, fifteenth yeah. day. It makes sense. This well, one, I, I disagree. I don't think the original Amityville Horror or the remake with uh, Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Uh, I think both of them are sort of elevated horror. I mean, Amityville Horror, I, I don't see it as sort of, uh, you know, like, Friday the 13th, where, where it's just a sort of slasher movie. Right, I, right. I, see, I actually see it closer to The Shining. Yeah. In, in terms of what they're trying to do and, and the story they're trying you to know, tell. I, I think it was, like, the second highest grossing movie of 1979. Yeah, it, was, it was huge. If you look at it now, it's like a TV movie. Well, I, I remember mean, recently, I think The House was for sale in Long Island. And, yes. And, made news cause... and uh, I'm obsessed with the movie house, the house that they, they took a real house in Toms River, New Jersey, and they yeah. built the facade on it, Yeah. and they used that for the first three movies, and that's the one that I'm obsessed with. And isn't it funny that that house cost more than the real Amityville house? <laughs> I mean, it was the real Amityville what's, house. What's the school was, district like? <laughs> the real Amityville house was up for grabs for one point two, and it ended up selling for nine hundred thousand, which is the size of a studio apartment in Greenwich Village. Isn't that funny? Yeah, but I've never lived in a place like that, and I don't even believe in that stuff. But there's just something about it. Would you? It's, oh, I'd love to. There's but, so many horror movies about people like the, what is it, Room fourteen oh eight, about being in the in the haunted sort of room. I just I would like the I circus of it, but um, it, it does be a circus. It, it does have the it, they did take out those those uh, wedge windows. So. That that was the one thing because I that's the famous wedge windows, mm -hmm. and I would always look for houses that looked like that, and none of them looked like that, and I didn't realize because that's not the front of the house. No, it's that's the, the side, side of the house, yes. and that's why I was like, why doesn't any house ever look like there, that? There there is a, a style of house. It's called a Dutch colonial, and uh, they are Ooh. they are peppered through New England, and every now and then when I run across an Amityville house, I, I knock on the door like, oh my god, you know. We move into the HGTV portion of the conversation. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, 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 it's, I don't know, it's... I know, but because uh, you said, like, oh, no one disagrees on The Shining. I, I do think it's one of those topics where people might be afraid to disagree, but I've definitely heard a lot of dissent yeah. on, on that movie. And the biggest argument is that it's not scary. Right. Well, Which I, I agree, I, it, it's not a sort of, because the one thing I don't like is sort of things jumping in front of sure. you. Sure. Because that, that I, I feel it's not really a scare. It jolts you, but it doesn't really terrify you. When I'm watching a horror movie, I want the movie that really affected me growing up was The Exorcist. I right. thought it was a 25th re-release in theaters. I went right. there, and that's a movie where like you're falling asleep, you're lying in bed at night, you close your eyes, and you start thinking about it. A Jewish person is afraid of The Exorcist. I remember uh, that's actually what my dad told me. Yeah, it, it John Landis said, the it, whole, well, like, "We don't the, believe in that." I was the only one who was not afraid of that movie. Yeah, that came that's out. what my dad said because I watched the hole also, where they dig the hole in the backyard and then all the demons come out. Yeah, and I'm terrified. I'm telling my dad, and he's like, "Wait, what happens?" He's like, "Oh, don't worry about that. We're Jews. We don't believe in exactly. that." Exactly. And for some reason, the way he said it, I'm like, "Oh, it's it's <laughs> like Santa Anderson, Claus." I slept it's... like a baby. <laughs> Um, a pile of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, there, there is a... I, I, I just think it's a, a lack of independent thought. And maybe, you know, people can be taught what to like, I think. And, you know, I don't know much about poetry. I really don't. I probably can't tell the difference between a good poem and a bad poem, you know? Or modern art. I would lie about that. But I think people sort of take the sound bites of The Shining and sort of repeat them. Um, it's just like... Uh, I mean, that beautiful helicopter shark clearly shows there's no head bathed in the back. <laughs> and then yeah. they talk about they, they can't have skiing there because it's too dangerous. Clearly, two ski lifts are shown on the side. Now, I was, am I saying that that's a bad mistake? No, I don't care about that mistake. But when you hold that movie up like the Risen the Jesus. Pedestal, yeah. And, uh, but and that, that, that comes from, and that's the, the one thing you really taught me that I walked away with is sort of this pedestal where people put yeah. filmmakers on a pedestal. They put movies on a pedestal. And at the end of the day, it is still a bunch of people right. who aren't scientists. This isn't a science. They're trying no. to figure out how are we going to keep someone entertained for two hours, which is incredibly difficult. Yeah. But, but also, I, I know it's based on a book, but ancient Indian burial ground has well-tread material, yeah. trod material. Mm -hmm. Also, I just, my opinion on the movie, I see, I have to defend it because, again, yeah. I've been 
crucified for this, but my opinion just didn't necessarily change. It won the Razzies that year. Yeah. It won the Razzies, and now people are like, oh, it was just misunderstood. It wasn't no. a critical hit. It made it, money, it, but it wasn't a critical hit. Steven Spielberg it, told he, uh, he's Kubrick bad. he didn't like I mean, Jack it. Nicholson yeah. is bad. It, it, it's, um, but, uh, no, that's a, that's a bunch of things. And, you know, I, I know, because, you know, what, what has come out in recent years, that they were making it without a script. They were making it, you know, Scott McCruthers... I resent the 45 minutes that we spend with him staring at a photo, slowly getting there to be killed when he walks in the door. And you know why they did that, because nothing happened. Well, that's one of those they things had we were to talking about him. watching a horror movie for laughing. I don't see anyone getting scared by that. It sort of feels like that's one of those moments yeah. where you laugh and throw popcorn at yeah. the screen. But that, that was a desperate thing because they realized no one is here. And some people tried to make a racial thing out of it, like, give him the black man, but... There was uh, there weren't that many other characters. They, they realized that there was yeah. there was n no threat or no, there was nothing yeah. horror. And also, just because we're filmmakers or film things, your big money shot is the blood coming down, right? Yeah. Why would you have that play in the opening scene with a little kid in the kitchen? Why would you show it then before we get to the hotel? Because when they show it later on, we've already seen it, so it has half the power. And also, when we see it later on. Shelley Duvall is seeing it, and technically she should be able to see it. It's very... This brings me to something, because years ago, and I, I remember every debate we've had. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like a film geek like that, and, and obviously uh, I'm relaunching this, the, the podcast, <laughs> so I, I couldn't think of a better guest uh, to argue movies with than you. But that's something you criticize Kubrick often about, and you also did it with Eyes Wide Shut, I'll where he shows the mask. The mask. Thank you for remembering yes. that. Oh, but that is just like an a, elephant over here. No, that is just a, a thing that I think if, if, if that had been your film, we probably would have had a discussion about mm -hmm. that. And um, I'm not saying that I'm right or wrong, but I really think that those two shots are, are out of place. Mm -hmm. And most people won't recognize that, but I, I make a compelling case for it. Why would you do that and then expect to get... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. I mean, I like it, but the reason is, again, like I said, I don't view The Shining necessarily as a horror movie. I see it as a drama. You know, and, and same with, with Eyes Wide Shut, where it's sort of what I feel Kubrick is doing is he's showing you stuff in advance because it's not about the popping on the screen. It's just about showing you this story. Now, the reason I love the movie, but the reason why I wanted to bring it up with you, because in the world of horror, right. I can definitely understand, you know, horror uh, people, you know, horror enthusiasts having a problem with this movie. No, it, no, It shouldn't no. necessarily be they, in the they, genre. They, 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 they don't. I, now really? you're, you're making it sound too highbrow. And like, just well, it just doesn't experience. resort to the, the fun house stuff. No, that has nothing to do with it. Actually, it's almost everyone's favorite horror movie. Really? I, oh, yeah. I, that's I, I not think, my experience. I think it's bullshit. I mean, I think that... that uh, I'll, 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 I'll argue to the grave on it, but um, I think it's when people can't go off book. Uh, but... Um, no, no, no. That is really? in the horror. Because yes, I've, I've heard is, a lot of people, like people I, who love the genre, uh, say that movie's just nope. not scary. No, maybe we're we're talking really, really young people now. But no, uh, no. Actually, young people are the ones that I notice, and that's why I find it fascinating. Because obviously, everything's now on Netflix yeah. and Amazon. So people who are discovering these movies, it's not because someone's there like, oh, Kubrick did Paths sure. of Glory. I got to watch every movie in his filmography. Right. They're just discovering the movies as huh, they are. I, they don't know these pedestals, and they're watching. I them, honestly, you know? I have never met anyone with a d dissenting opinion on the. And and That's sometimes I have to say, listen, you switch it, friends. It's it's. I said, you listen to me. It's only because I'm so passionate about this genre, but um, you know, I think it's pretentious. Yes, it's about a man's slow progression to the insane, but they completely fucked that up because he's goes from regular to insane within. Five minutes. It's, so it's like even on that, it, yeah, it's it, not a slow progression. No. So, but uh, you but know, being what? cooped up in that house, it's with, beautiful. Uh, it's got everything money can buy. You right. know. So just the the grand, the grand spectacle of it. Well, that's another thing. Also, should horror as a genre have overblown budgets? I mean, no, does I'm, that? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe that movie needed to have. I I I, I don't know. But but, but I'm talking about more uh, like in terms of the remakes. I mean, like you uh, mentioned, My Bloody Valentine. Now they're taking movies that sort of. You know, start her off a certain way. Even the Halloween, the way they're doing now, where it sort of blew up as this huge sort of, you yeah. know, you know, movie. Uh, the charm that the movies had, the reason why they became cult classics, is because of the simplicity of what they were showing. Yeah, you know? I think so. Yeah, I think some of the, I, I think the new Halloween. They're trying to say they did it for ten. You know, with and, and and Jamie Lee got a the back end. I think everyone got a back end deal on it. So she's yeah. but um, and adjusted dollars. That's 
very, very cheap. Um, yeah, especially since everything's being shot yeah. digitally now. It's much faster. There's no pre-production anymore. So, but uh, or they'll, we'll shoot it with multiple multiple yeah. cameras and stuff. But um, that that company Blumhouse does have a nice business model. Mm-hmm. They, even if they get like J Lo to be in their movie, mm-hmm. she. They are not going to get her a trailer. They're not going to do anything. She waves all that. If she, she wants was it, one she of the anacondas, it. so I'm not going to. I'm not going <laughs> to knock her. I, I like those movies. Uh, and by the way, because a lot of times people don't even watch these movies in theaters anymore, I think there's no better genre for a movie theater than horror. Oh yeah, and and it's a shame because people are watching these movies on their cell phones now, and it's like, oh, I love horror movies, and they don't realize part of the joy of watching this movie is in the theater with a bunch of other people. Right. I mean, like, do well, you believe what they're showing us. But there, you're, you're. But you're talking about The Shining being like a meditation, so maybe it doesn't need to be a group thing. But uh, yeah, but that's uh, but I'm, some I'm, of the carnival yeah. stuff. Yeah, it does. Yeah, actually. but like a, a movie like Friday the Thirteenth. I I give you full permission, but I'm not done with The Shining yet. I'm only because I have an intelligent person sitting across from me. But um, there was a, a hilarious. You remember, of course, Pauline Kael, one of the most yeah, infamous critics, critics yeah, of the all Ebert the, before Ebert. Yeah, wrote all those wonderful books. But uh, she had actually come out of retirement to review Eyes Wide Shut because she had retired. And, uh, she said, Kubrick has crafted the most thought-provoking erotic thriller of 1958, meaning that, in her opinion, he was just so out of touch. And I think maybe The Shining is a little bit that way, too. I, I, this is where I, me being a movie nerd yeah. comes in. One of my favorite movies of 1978, was filmed in 77, is this big budget Goldie Hawn Chevy Chase movie called Foul Play, Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, Foul Play has uh, the Oscar winning song, Ready to Take a Chance Again by Barry Manilow, is the Coast Road helicopter shot of a yellow VW bug for the opening credits. And um, if that had been the other way around, that would have been considered a shiny. Uh, another, for people my age, the movie that scarred our childhood was called Burnt Offerings, a haunted house movie. And at the end, it zooms into a picture, and it turns out they've always been there. I mean, so this stuff has always been around. Oh, oh, oh what is the, the theme to The Shining? Dun, 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 dun. That was the theme to The Car in the, in the, <laughs> the movie with, with James Brolin, God bless it. So... It, yeah, no, I, well, the, the thing about Eyes Wide Shut is, and I remember there was the big thing when it was coming out, where is it going to be NC-17? They, they had to block some stuff out or yeah. re-edit it, and it was being sold as this be, big sex thriller. You know, yeah. This was, uh, I don't remember if this was after around the time of Showgirls. And I think the problem with the movie wasn't the movie, I think it was the marketing of the movie. And I think that's a lot of movies just suffer from that, because mm-hmm. that movie had, what was it? Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about sex, he goes out looking... But the actual erotic scene, it's the scene in the house. Is that really the whole movie, you know, him walking through the house, or is there more to it? I think that was Warner did, Brothers trying to did, sell a movie didn't on sex. did we see the... But again, I think that's where, where Stanley Kubrick might be a little bit out of touch, because, you know, he had probably not seen a movie since the 60s, but a, a naked woman there with an avant-garde mask on is, is not provoking, thought-provoking in 2000, whatever it came out. It's again. He's he's he's. Yeah, but then again, it's sort of become a part of lexicon now, where people say, "Oh, are they going to an eyes wide shut party?" When talking about rich people, it is a part of conversation. Now. Absolutely, but but I in just, a humorous way. I know? just I just don't think like I just watched the house that Jack built, the Lars von Trier movie, and again, someone's so out of touch, dude. Watch Henry Se- Portrait of a Serial Killer. You're not doing anything Which is a here. Henry just, Portrait of a Serial Killer is a fucking masterpiece. I just want to say that I don't think it gets enough credit. I, I always try to tell people get credit. about it. Oh no, seriously, I, it I does. don't. I don't feel so. I know you're hanging around. Where, where's the John wrong McNaughton? People. If they got credit, John McNaughton right now would be one of the top he, directors still still making. He movies. had a, a story. There was one picture that he did that really really bombed. I forgot the name of it. And uh, Mad Dog and Glory. I think. Yeah, I love that movie yeah. with uh, Bill Murray playing. And I think it, it sort of put a little nail or made it difficult. Um, but Wild Things is a great movie. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I just feel because that movie, it's people don't even realize it's it, it is to some extent the slasher sure. movie. It, it's just oh no, it's horror. It's 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 it's, it's oh, horrifying it's and, and riveting. But the house that Jack built is just so pretentious. But again, I I can't talk to anyone about it because they will only Lars mention Trier. La, they will mention La, uh, Von Trier. Can we talk about it as a movie? I'm gonna first? be honest, and this is again n- nothing to knock him because yeah. I'm not gonna say anything. Right, maybe on Mike about him. Sure, but I have not seen a movie that he's made that I've oh. enjoyed. Oh. It ha- it has not happened. Well, like I say, I wash my. Oh, hands. they're coming for me. I know they're uh, coming. The cops from, are coming they're coming for, for, yeah, for me. They heard me. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I don't. I I can't be the auteurist. I have to look at the movie as a movie first. Yeah, can I tell that he directed it? Yeah, because when these directors who their their last names become adjectives. Yeah. 
um, they homage themselves. I mean, yeah, it, it sort of does become a, a sure when people style. say, "Oh no, yeah. it's a Kubrick film, it's a Kubrick film." Like, yeah, because yeah, he, 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 how indulgent do you have to be? Like. Tim Burton. Every year, I'm gonna make a movie. It's gonna look the same. It's gonna have my wife in it. I'm gonna have the scary tree. You know, and to me, an interesting director is when you get a script and you figure out how that story yeah. needs to look. The I, actors in here. I, I do feel that people sort of get locked into certain filmmakers and don't branch out. And what I'd love to do is sort of show a, a Hal Ashby movie to someone and tell them it's a, a Kubrick movie. People don't get locked you know? into it. They they uh, it's um, it's we play the auteur game when it is convenient and when it is easy and millions of dollars exchange hands for people to know the name Tim Burton as a brand yeah. so they'll say like do you like Burton I would remember I would trick the film students who directed mm -hmm. Nightmare Before Christmas everyone raised their hand Tim Burton yeah. no he's oh. like co-executive well, producer Henry Selleck right? Henry Selleck poor Henry Selleck can you imagine him in a bar yeah. trying to get laid yeah. like no you didn't direct that like, I, remember, I remember you asking that you also asked uh, what was it uh Willy Wonka. Who here loves Willy Wonka? Yeah. You know? No new Mel Stewart. Yeah, but you I'm know, like, if you love a movie just because it's not from this director who has a whole filmography yeah. that you happen, you know, yeah. that was promoted, marketed, yeah. you should still look who made the damn movie. If we have IMDb. If, if you're if you're interested, yeah. yeah. But people, people, uh, you know, Tim Burton's probably got a major publicist. I mean, oh. I, I I've known Star Wars nerds when I asked them who directed Empire Strikes Back. They have no clue. But yeah. these are people who claim to know yeah. everything. Um, but uh, Oh, I mean, nothing against the, the the Tim the Tim Burton stuff, but it's just like that is the name that that people know. And I think Henry Selleck didn't when he did a movie called Coraline after Carlene, mm -hmm. the marketing was from the creator yeah. of Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah. So when you start believing that, then you're you're in on the marketing. It's a corporate cheeseburger. Oh so, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I, do you feel it hurts students of film, like yes. aspiring filmmakers? You know, because that's how they look at it. Uh, for students, yeah. For for like, I would say like for my mom, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, she can under she she's allowed to think that. But I think for for students, because it's the most competitive industry in the world, you have got to be the smartest person in the mm -hmm. room. You got to know that when it says Quentin Tarantino presents Hostel, that that is a business thing. He probably never even saw the movie. Mm -hmm. So you know, I like we were talking about. Sometimes I think it's like a rite of passage. We go through this sort of pretentious thing. Yeah. But when when people are so blindly ignorant that they think they're being what is the word uh, subversive no not sub transgressive by like yeah. going anti Hollywood never but they don't realize that the the indie stuff is just as much it is about marketing and it's it's just yeah. a different well there yeah. used to be uh, Paramount had a indie imprint yeah. Warner yeah. Brothers had I mean they got sure. rid of all of it yeah. but they all saw money being made in, sure. in indie after the nineties and they all started sort of putting the, out these movies the, the people who who refer to directors by their last name and stuff I, I say this if you're gonna if you're gonna play the auteur game you gotta go all the way and chances are you probably only know 10 names oh uh, yeah and I'm gonna smack that dick out of your mouth and chances <laughs> are none of them are from the 30s which is which is another thing probably not yeah because you mentioned like you know watching a movie and seeing where that stuff comes from what people don't realize is a lot of the Kubrick style is from the silent film era sure. it's just you know looking at that stuff the the wide angle you know well, and then that becomes the, what's that, the, the Sidney, Lumet, Sidney Lumet wrote, that style is the most misunderstood word since love. Most people get style mixed up with just decorating, you know. Yeah. And I think people grow and change, and if I'm doing a comedy, I probably don't want it to look like the drama that I shot or the thriller that I shot. Yeah. And I think sometimes direct, directors who have this stamp that they have to make everything the same that makes is not interesting to me. And people love to call it style, and I think it makes... Film nerds feel intelligent when they can recognize a signifier from a director, and I, I just think that's, I don't know. Well, also, they don't realize a lot of style isn't coming from the director, but what cinematographer they're yeah. working with, and yeah. if they happen to be working with yeah. the same cinematographer. Sure. I mean, you look at the Coen brothers, and everyone talks about the Coen brothers' look, and that's a lot of that is just a Roger Deakins. Well, be, uh, and also because lots of money exchanges hands, so we know about the Coen brothers, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... But uh, no, I notice a lot of these directors, which I, I mean, nothing against them. I have to go original uh, by the movie. Yeah, they, they make visual. When your movie can be, when your whole career can be parodied in an SNL skit, like a Wes Anderson movie, your whole oeuvre can be it's parodied. Like to start over. And no, well, not start over, but you, you just, the, the fans are just full of shit. Yeah. It makes you, I think it makes 
I wrote an article for a, a, a hipster magazine called Mass Appeal a few days ago. I mean, a few years ago. How ironic! And it was a. Uh, it was called Smart Movies for Dumb People, uh, movies that make stupid people feel smart. And it was like me making fun of like American Beauty and stuff like yeah. that. Like, and uh, I, uh, they told me they got great response. Like people wanted to kill me. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, I love certain movies, but movies are all about debate. I mean, I once got yeah. into an argument with someone over uh, Saving Private Ryan because they didn't like it and I was younger. And it's only now that I'm, that I'm realizing people are allowed to not like movies. I mean, sure. that's the whole beauty of it. And right. if you like a movie, that doesn't mean you have to recreate that movie. Just figure out why you liked it for yourself. Yeah. And if you can write that down besides the fact, well, it looks like a Kubrick movie, Absolutely. then did you really like it? Absolutely. And that's I can what... tell you what I like about these movies. I can tell you the story, how they sort of took it. Sure. Like I mentioned with, you know, why why he shows you stuff before you feel you're supposed to see it. Right. And it's a, to get a rid of that, you know, suspense, which you're never supposed to do in a movie, let alone a horror movie. Well, I don't know. But uh, no, I, I'm, I'm like you. It's, uh, but you know what? It's, it, to me, if I, if I have to be brutally honest, now that I'm thinking about it, it's not necessarily the movie. It's the people's reaction to the movie yeah. that is very perplexing to me. Yeah. Very, very perplexing well, to me. Well, I mean... Just I, I'm like you said. Oh, we're becoming older, so we're we're in that phase now. Where it's like, oh, kids don't know what they're doing anymore. Well, and my argument is, well, the, the new generation of movies. I just saw The Mule by Clint Eastwood, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you won't see anything like that coming out from the new generation of filmmakers. Right. Why? Why are they not like? Why is the coolest movie I've seen in theaters all year by a 90 year old guy? You know, not to knock anyone who's over a certain age, but it's not a 90 year old man who should be putting out the most badass movie in theaters. You know, so so what is it well, about the generations coming up? He's, he's got the he's got the green light potential. He's got he could probably make a movie about a guy reading the ingredients in a bag of Cheetos and get it released. So I don't know. Yeah, but even in the, I mean, looking at the new Creed movie and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and I, I still enjoyed it. But I mean, you look at the original Rocky. What was the original Rocky about? It was the guy who smoked, was a bum. You know, <laughs> it's people. A lot of people who love the Rocky franchise don't even know what the original Rocky movie. was was right you know and there's some scenes in there that right now would obviously if anyone actually watched the movie here's how i don't know to watch it because they would be tweeting like crazy about it oh right. rocky should have been in jail that's right. you know borderline you know whatever he was doing to talia Shah. You know, i have like, never had someone say oh do you like alvidson never you know why he often didn't take the vanity credit he didn't marry someone famous he didn't have a press agent he's just a director and a lot of projects he did he he brought how a vision to that project rather than making every, Saturday Night Fever does not necessarily look like Rocky, mm -hmm. which does not look like Bird on a Wire. Mm -hmm. so to me, that's an interesting director, but no one will write about that. Yeah. You won't, yeah. Be, you won't be an adjective. And here's the thing. Uh, uh, one of my favorite directors, Stuart Rosenberg, you know? Well, it's funny that you say he that. He makes great movies. He's made enough great You're movies. You're talking about Stuart Rosenberg? Yeah. Well, that's... that's I just um, am trying to get a hold of Darren Aronofsky because Stewart directed Amityville Horror, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I, I, I uh, apparently Rosenberg. I mean, um, Darren Aronofsky. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rosenberg was his mentor at USC Film yeah. School. Well, he's made the point I'm trying to make is he's made enough movies in his filmography sure. that there's no reason why he shouldn't be on that sort of pedestal that everyone lists. You know, Lumet, Scorsese, right. Spielberg. But why isn't he? You know, he, he's made enough movies that you are know why? phenomenal. Because I think, because people are going to say he has no style. And that's ridiculous. Because his style is there, I'm sure. It's just invisible. It's true, true style, you're not supposed to notice it, you know. Yeah. But you can't say that he doesn't have a style. A style well, is how you work with actors and everything. But you know what? Here's what I did learn. Like when I talked about uh, Mel Stewart. Gets yeah. no credit. But when, apparently when he died, like within a day like Spielberg was on a plane mm -hmm. George Lucas was on a plane well the filmmakers know because so, we're all film geeks but uh, I could probably interview Steven Spielberg about Stuart Rosenberg he probably knows all about yeah. him so the people who do know I, mean, I bet you um, Tarantino knows about well, Stuart Rosenberg well that's why I said with Tarantino yeah. I, I don't as much look forward to his movies as I do uh, whenever I see he did an interview or somewhere on some obscure yeah. podcast sure Way obscure than this, obviously. Yeah. You know, we're at the top of the mountain yeah, over right. here. <laughs> but because uh, I, I love listening to them sure. talk about, you know, what got them into movies, uh, and you know, and such as yourself, where now you're writing a book about the movies you sort of grew up fetishizing. Right. But if he had not said that about Amityville too, I would not be able to write a book because that 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 that's is what possible, gave it yeah. credibility in order. Oh, people want this. It's well, really, that's something. Yeah, the movie's more popular it, now. Yeah, they have the. I feel personally they have the responsibility, filmmakers, because 
they love movies yeah. and loving movies is more than just the opportunity to make movies yeah it's keeping that alive so. i'm so glad you mentioned stuart rosenberg because uh i'm trying to find his son yeah. i think his name is ben oh, I love him. but his, his son was uh i think like an intern on the first amityville horror or something like that really? and uh I, i'm dying i'm dying for those stories and he did uh pop up greenwich village he did a lot of stuff of course but no one's gonna say do you like rosenberg but uh what do, what do you think when people would say this oh he was a journeyman or a hack that 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 those terms piss me off because a hack how many of his movies you know did so well people now assume that you're a hack or a journeyman if all your movies are different i just think that makes for an interesting person didn't he do cool hand luke yeah i mean it, it's you're looking at this director you're looking yeah. at his movies yeah. and the filmography is amazing but it's they, they don't get the respect and maybe it is the publicist sort sure. of angle of it you know yeah. maybe they didn't want that to be that sort of auteur. i mean david fincher has a lot of that where he, sure. he says he doesn't want them to use his name yeah but he is he's always been he's been annoying to, to me just as a as a film teacher because people would say do you like fincher do you like fincher i'm like can we just talk about the movie yeah Seriously. which is what he says himself right you know when like, i heard that he said that i was like yeah like, he oh, said that himself yeah. he's like i don't want people to say oh a david fincher film because i want the movie to sort of sell itself yeah but that's that's not marketing yeah he, so. he became a, a hipster brand right away i knew that i was i couldn't be friends with someone when that would be like one of the first conversations I've david got. fincher well uh, now i when someone says do you like burton or something like that i always say oh i never met him <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I don't know if I like him. Maybe. maybe I, I don't know. I, Depends I, what cocktail I, party. I have to go by. I can't yeah. lie and say that all Hitchcock movies are good. I can't. Actually, the Hitchcock movies that everyone says are the best, I personally don't like. I think North by Northwest is ridiculous. Oh, I'm I think, not a fan. I think it's a terrible movie. I don't like it. All right, I, here come the cops. I, yeah, it's I don't bad. understand. No, everyone who loves it, I just don't understand what are they so enthralled with. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's made movies that I love. You know, sure. I, I personally think the, the older stuff, the... the him in the 40s when he was doing just a straight film noir the, yeah, the thrillers doubt is, is yeah so that good. stuff is great but then once he started making like you know vertigo is another one everyone yeah. goes crazy over it. and i just i don't see what they All say right, in if it. we get a bunch of people who don't know much about movies but are intelligent people and we show them the first hour of the birds it is a terrible romantic comedy i mean yeah. it is it is maybe it's bad on purpose but you can't tell me that it's that the, it, the birds aren't scary. Yeah, it's, no, it's not scary. It's like what's it's that? A, listen, I love it. It's absolutely adorable. But you've had the Kool Aid if you're gonna yeah. sit there and, and I'm gonna. Here's where where I'm gonna make a lot of enemies. To me, when I think of the birds, I think of the happening by M Night Shyamalan, <laughs> where it's the wind blows, a few leaves rustle, and we're all supposed to get freaked out in the yep. audience. I'm yep. like, what, what am I watching really over here? And the happening does have that great opening scene though at the construction site where the guys start jumping off and it's like raining construction workers Ugh. see but that when i was watching that i'm like what's so scary so we're gonna kill ourselves yeah. like if i'm killing myself and i don't even realize it because i'm under some influence sure. then at that point it, it doesn't even make a difference i mean we're all we're all on our <laughs> way out anyway you know it's just a matter of time but you know what i think a bunch of his movies should have been like a good 30 minutes short they would have been a great like Twilight Zone, yeah. Well, he's actually bounced back, because I remember I went to see Inception, very specifically, and before Inception, they were uh, showing a trailer for, what was it, Devil or something? The movie with the elevator that he didn't even direct. I think he produced No, it's it. his company. Yeah. yeah, and they were showing a trailer for it, and everyone was interested. Everyone's yeah. like getting excited about uh -huh. it. And then they flashed from M. Night Shyamalan. Right. The whole theater started sure. laughing. His Absolutely. name became a And legend. then he did a couple movies where they didn't even, he, they didn't even put his name above it. Like that last yeah. Airbender did not did not yeah. bill itself as an M. Night Shyamalan yeah. picture. But because of Glass and, and what was yeah. it that they're starting to come out. And I enjoyed it. I, I th you know, I think I think what happens is he's, he's can I swear on this? He yeah, started, yeah, he's, knock yourself He started out. sucking his own dick. I mean, he started oh, to massive, believe his own But dick. he was doing that from the beginning. He was yeah. doing that after The Sixth Sense, which I thought was one of his weaker movies. Yeah. I, but I really, really liked that found footage movie he did, The Visit. Yeah, yeah, where well, they go that, to grandma's house. That twist ending, if oh, I, I, when I saw that twist ending, I was like, God, if I had thought of that ending, I would rule the world right now. I thought it was that clever. Well, I feel that's something a lot of directors should from time to time do that they don't anymore, is sort of go back to not having a $50 million budget. Think, not, not back to having everything at your disposal. He had to. I mean, think that was the deal. He had to make that for the cheap in order to, just like if I want to put my myself out there right now, do you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to do what I did in film school. I'm going to have to make a kick-ass short and start over again, and that that is that is the way, and uh, no one cares about my degrees or my past stuff or if it's old. So um, I think, from what I understand, he and De Palma needed to do this too. After a, a string of flops, he needed to do Raising Cain mm -hmm. on the cheap, 
uh, you know, giving up all the stuff that he has access to to put himself back on the map. So uh, I think Brian De Palma is, and fortunately now because of these documentaries where it's younger filmmakers sort of trying to, you know, shine a light on them, I think Brian De Palma, his career, it's, I mean, this guy made such great, I, I get very passionate about it. He's made such amazing fucking movies that no one wants to talk he, about. He, he's the reason why, well, again, I, I, I don't meet anyone who doesn't want to talk about De Palma. No, they want to talk about Scarface, which I love. I think uh, it's a masterpiece. But like you mentioned, Blowout. Yeah. Who wants to talk? Who wants to talk about John Everyone. Travolta? You know, besides Pulp Fiction, John Travolta made some great movies that weren't Grease and Pulp Fiction. You know, sure. it, it's no, but but Blowout is is considered, I think, a, I a, a cinephile's dream. But De Palma's the reason why cinephile, I went, yes, cinephile. Uh, De Palma's yes. the reason why I went to Sarah Lawrence. I went there yeah. only because of him. And uh, he he actually made a movie with students while he was teaching there. Home oh, movies. home movies. I, yeah. I know. Don't, don't yeah. try to get me. Yeah. Yeah. I um, dedicated a lot of time to not productive stuff. A great me. score by <laughs> Pino Donaggio. Yeah. And one of my uh, best friends is this wonderful <laughs> character actress named Ratanya Alda, who she's like one of the leads in the uh, the Deer Hunter, and she's star of Amityville too. But uh, she was in that that Sarah Lawrence troupe mm-hmm. of uh, in the '60s and '70s, of doing all the De Palma movies like. Um, Hi, mom. Mm-hmm. Greetings. She's yeah, in all those with with Jennifer and, and Salt, yeah. and yeah, it was yeah. like a. I remember when I, when uh, you you were inviting everyone over to talk about movies, and uh, I was looking through your DVDs, and it's all horror, 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 <laughs> horror. And then I see uh, what was it? The Wedding Party. Uh, that was De Palma's first movie that he did while still in college. Yeah, he, yeah, he didn't yeah. direct it himself, but I saw that. I'm like, uh, can I borrow this? Oh, and that sure. was uh, Lloyd Kaufman of all people put that out. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the horror stuff is the stuff that I wanted to collect. Some of those yeah. I didn't even watch, yeah. you know. But uh, well, that's why I find it so interesting because horror, like we call it, the bastard sort of genre. Mm. But at the end of the day, you're here a person who can tell me, you know, some obscure movie from 1945. Who was the editor on that? You know, and, and some story <laughs> about it. And and you try to elevate the horror genre as more than just being sort of schlock, as being yep. important, which which it is. I feel every genre is important. Well, now it's it's kind of important. You know why? Because now you got people like J.J. Abrams, you got people like Quentin Tarantino who are talking about their rabid fandom, and again, now it makes it cool. Yeah, but then it what totally I, makes it yeah, cool. Then what happens is you sort of get Hollywood doing horror, and I don't want to see that. I want to see the next Sam Raimi. I want to see the next Evil Dead. You know. Right, but it it for people who who would have uh, chastised me like why do you watch this shit? I remember mm-hmm. when we have Fangoria magazine. I mm-hmm. I dread going to the checkout counter at the bookstore because I usually get a, a a lecture from the woman about why would you do this. But now it's that kind of shit is is hip. It takes a cool person to say it. It's like buying porn. Like that's the sort of like oh this is what you're reading. Sure, you know, but now it's uh, no, it's a perfectly legitimate. It, it, like you said, it comes in. Uh, ebbs, it's ebbs and flows. It's all ebbs genres. I mean, there's the gangster genre. You know, right. now just happens to be horror because I feel we're we're living in an era now where there are no stars. Stars aren't selling movies. It's superheroes. It's yeah. franchises selling movies. And I feel horror, like you said, horror is not a star driven genre. Not necessarily, right? It's, it's a it's concept driven. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a concept that drives it. That's sort of the final girl concept, yeah. the, the horror of it. And you know, I'm still torn on the subject because there's so many I mean, what was it? Uh the the strangers with uh yeah. with Liv Taylor. That the whole point of the movie, the, the one thing you want to get suspense from is Who's going to be left alive at the end? Yeah. When you have one character left alive in the first 15 minutes, sure. you know for the rest of that movie, it's just someone running around. Nothing's going to happen. I am with you 100%. Yeah, that was terrible. Yeah. They couldn't hold off a, a little lot bit to of kill people someone liked it. And I also thought so much of it was just, it looked like it was because the shot was cool. Yeah. We see the couple here and then a person in the mask in the background. Yeah. Like, that's scary once. You yeah. can't build a movie on it. I think what they did was they, they took the failure of that and then did The Purge. And I, I see a connection between those movies in, in my sick huh. mind. Because The Purge I actually did enjoy. Now it's a TV series. The original Purge. Then it sort of became like this whole franchise. Yeah. And, and the worst thing that happens is a good movie comes out and everyone says, we're living in it. It's becoming reality. Right, right, I'm like, right. I'm like the, the, let's relax a little bit over here. Holy Batman. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but uh, I think uh, Purge 2 or 3 was like one of the most... Uh, cost to profit ratio was one of the most profitable yeah, movies all these made. movies are made like under 10 million and these are the big budget ones yeah. and they bring in the same numbers as sort of the the temple movies yeah. which which good for them not, not i mean not all i mean like the the, the new carrie a couple years ago didn't yeah. didn't you know well carrie is, is i never found carrie herself scary what terrified me and again as a jewish kid you you, <laughs> you bring it up what terrified me was jesus in that movie and people totally missed the it's religious not, subtext it's not jesus it's, it's saint sebastian jesus. Oh, Saint Sebastian, with the, the face that pops up. 
the statue in her closet. I miss Sunday school. But yeah, when, when she's people, in the closet and then the face pops up. People don't realize that. I it's, could it's not say that. There is something about it. I, I just find religious <laughs> stuff in general fucking terrifying. Do you really? <laughs> and I think it's supposed to be terrifying because the whole concept, I mean, that was the original horror. You know, we're going to scare right. people into wanting to go to heaven and not sin. Oh, sure. And I just found it terrifying. And, and I think that all gets lost. Wait, uh, 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 Jews don't believe in hell? Oh, part of the I don't go to synagogue either. I'm oh, gonna be, okay. I'm gonna be deadly honest with you. Well, there's always that okay. anti-Semitic joke. With Jews, hell is where you have to pay retail or something like that. I don't I know. I thought it was acid <laughs> reflux. Acid <laughs> reflux. <laughs> Got a pocket full of tums right now. Uh, well, listen, it was great chatting with you. Uh, let's not wait another 10, 12 years sure. to do this again. And I, uh, I apologize about my shining rant, but... Uh, no, 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 I love that. I live for that, because the worst thing I hate is when you're talking with people and you bring up the same movie. It's like, I love that movie. It's like, okay, we're all just <laughs> smelling our own farts. It's like, okay, I, that's when I start to feel like yeah. I sort of feel pretentious over here. I just like, want to have a talk I just about it. Yeah, I just want to argue, debate a movie. And that's why I like Hitchcock. I, I love to be able to say I didn't enjoy it. I thought it was boring, yeah. you know, and it's... And and I didn't learn anything from it to make me a better filmmaker. Huh. And and that's what I want to say. All these people were like sure. not not just the audiences but the cinephiles who say, I love this movie. Well, how did that movie make you a better filmmaker? Sure. I think I think I think of that all the time. And I think yeah. that if I had done that edit, the eyes wide shut edit with the mask, I think that most of my brethren at NYU and my professors would probably have told me to switch it like I think it should be switched. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, I, don't... <laughs> I, I function under the Volan Trub style, which is slightly out of focus with terrible sound. <laughs> so we, we all sort of try to build our own brand. I think we should have our own morning show. That's what she said back then also. We should. And, and that's, <laughs> Did I really say that? Yeah, you oh said my that. God. That you gave me the you... idea for this. and, and So uh, I basically created you. Yes. Oh, my God. You I, built I, me. I see what an effect they've had on our society and culture. I like this. Absolutely. Listen, a lot of good filmmakers came from you. Uh, my yeah. movie, like I said, I, I started you know just with a hope and a dream and then realized a hope and a dream isn't going to make a movie. So I made a movie. Congratulations you know, on Suzy yeah. Q. I looked it Suzy up. Q, the, uh, the Suzy Q. And I, it's I'm on my by. IMDb as special thanks. Thank you for that. Yes. yes. Uh, the Dirty Kind, my new movie, uh -huh. screened at just a few blocks from here, the Anthology Film Archives. Uh -huh. It screened at a Regal Theater in Queens. So I got a Regal <laughs> Theater in Queens. And now uh, we're looking for a 2019 release. So look forward to that. There's Dead Hookers. It's a good time. Thank you very much. And thank you, Brian. Thank you.